When you think about recycling cars, you think about car crushers. And we have some really big car crushers that can process up to six cars a minute. But that spits out a lot of scrap that then needs to be further processed. And we need machines that are able to chew through that. To meet this demand, a colossal monster with a huge appetite was developed. The Daniele Lynx Shredder. It's the largest shredder in the world. It can process up to 350 tons or 450 vehicles an hour, breaking each of those down into their individual metallic components. The Lynx Shredder is more than just a machine. It's an entire complex, some five stories high and spanning 150 meters. And its sole mission is to chew up tons of scrap metal into small pieces as fast and efficiently as possible. It's amazing that this machine can shred 350 tons of metal in one hour. But something has to get those 350 tons inside the machine. First, the cars get crushed down to reduce their volume. Then they're loaded into the infeed system. There are two different designs to get the junk into the shredder machine, the tilt table and the conveyor belt. The tilt table is manufactured from heavy plate steel. This thing is basically a dump truck mounted on the side of a building. It's extremely strong and is built to take a beating. Hydraulic cylinders will actually move the tilt open to one side so that the excavator can load it and then tip it the other way and dump it into the facility. The other way to load the Lynx shredder is with a conveyor, which seems pretty self-explanatory. But this conveyor is robust enough to handle 350 tons of scrap metal being dropped on it every hour. If you think about that, that's like 450 end of light vehicles being loaded in every 60 minutes. Enter the Large Hadron Collider. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the Large Hadron Collider is the biggest machine on the planet. This thing is huge. It's a 27 kilometer underground ring located at a CERN facility near Geneva, Switzerland. The reason the Large Hadron Collider is so large is because it has one task, to destroy the smallest particles possible so we can better understand how they work. The LHC is a really big particle accelerator. Basically, it's a bunch of magnets strung together that accelerate subatomic particles to near light speed so we can literally smash them together and see what they break up into so that we understand what the fundamental building blocks of those particles are. The protons and electrons that the Large Hadron Collider work with are so tiny that the task of making them collide is akin to firing two needles 10 kilometers apart with such precision that they meet halfway. And how the Large Hadron Collider does this is incredible. The LHC needs a really high vacuum environment so the subatomic particles don't interact with matter. If the subatomic particles were allowed to interact with matter, they'd be annihilated and lost. So within the LHC ring, there's a tube that is kept at very high vacuum that the particles travel in. Subatomic particles can be accelerated in rings like the LHC or by linear accelerators. In a linear accelerator, we accelerate the particles in a line rather than around a ring. And linear accelerators really help us to get the particles up to speed before we inject them into a ring. The LHC has two linear accelerators, Linux 3 and Linux 4, which produce the particles and inject them into the large LHC ring. After the CL415 discharges its water, it doesn't go back to base. Instead, it uses a clever design element that allows it to go get right back into the fight. Well, the beauty of the CL415 is its ability to take water from local water sources. As long as the water's about 1.4 meters deep and they have a run of about 2,000 meters, they can go in and scoop the water up in 12 seconds and be back in the air and back to the firefight in, in moments, really, and, and then turn around and do it again. So that's what makes it so effective. The CL415 aircraft can remain on mission for up to three hours, dropping typically nine tank loads of water on a fire, refilling from a water source 10 kilometers away. The CL415 is a phenomenal machine. Its ability to pick up water uh, at six times in an hour over a three hour period before it needs to refuel uh, delivers a big punch to a fire. Canadair's exceptional design, permitting the aircraft to refill from nearby water sources rather than returning to base to reload, combined with turboprop engines, results in a lower fuel burn per liter of water drop compared to land-based aircraft. And a key to this utility 
is the design of the craft. As wildfires become more and more common, we have to turn to new technology and specialized machines to help us fight this force of nature. One of the most interesting things about the CL-415 is its ability to land and take off on water. In order to do that, the fuselage of the aircraft is shaped like the hull of a boat. This allows the aircraft to gain enough velocity over water to take off. In addition, the engines are mounted high on the wings, and that's really important because the propellers need to be high enough up that they won't impact the water during takeoff and landing. Additionally, because boat hulls are not particularly stable to rocking motions, there are pontoons on the wingtips to prevent the aircraft from overturning. To keep up with the demand of the international economy, the heavy equipment company Evergreen launched the first of its A-class series of container ships, the Ever Ace, in 2021. Those A-class ships are also known as ULCV, or Ultra Large Container Vessels, and the Ever Ace is the largest of them all. The Ever Ace is the biggest cargo vessel ever built. It was built at Samsung Heavy Industries in South Korea. What is the biggest we can go? I think that was the question they asked, like, how big can we build this thing? And they kind of work backwards from there. It's thinking about the constraints of your project. So looking at where is our pinch point? What is the narrowest place that we need to navigate? That's kind of bounding your engineering problem to say, this is our biggest restriction, so let's maximize whatever we can do within that boundary. Canals like the Panama Canal can only accept ships of a certain size. If they're too big, they won't fit through the locks. In 2016, the Panama Canal was upgraded to accept ships up to 125,000 tons and 366 meters in length. This still isn't big enough for the Ever Ace. This ship is massive. It's more than 400 meters long and weighs 230,000 tons. With its massive size, meaning it is unable to navigate the Panama Canal, the Ever Ace maintains a route from ports in Asia, like Taipei and Shanghai, through the Suez Canal to Felixstowe, Rotterdam, and Hamburg in Europe. The Ever Ace is really a marvel of engineering. It can hold over 24,000 TEUs. Those are 20-foot equivalent units, and those are your standard sea shipping containers. The Ever Ace cargo vessel is simply massive. You can stack 12 cargo containers high and more than 60 wide across the deck. The Ever Ace can carry 24,000 shipping containers. That's about 720 million kilograms of materials. That's enough to carry half a million cars. The Sea Hunter is novel because it's autonomous, and being autonomous, it doesn't need a crew. Thus, for the Sea Hunter, the designers could remove all the equipment needed for people. One of the most important considerations in the design of the Sea Hunter is that it's unmanned. And in being unmanned, it avoids many of the restrictions of a conventional vessel. So in the design of a conventional vessel, it is built around the people inside. It is built to protect them. And you no longer have that requirement in an unmanned vehicle like the Sea Hunter, which allows it to reduce the weight and to go further and explore further. Removing the features required on a manned ship means a lighter, sleeker design for the Sea Hunter. The Sea Hunter is equipped with two diesel engines. These diesel engines require a relatively large amount of fuel. Of the 135 tons of weight of the Sea Hunter, 40 tons of that is fuel. Now that sounds like a lot of fuel, and it is, because it allows the Sea Hunter to operate autonomously for 90 days without resupply. During those 90 days, the Sea Hunter can travel up to 18,500 kilometers. So it can travel all the way from San Diego to Guam without need for refueling. Additionally, during that period, the Sea Hunter can reach speeds of up to 27 knots, a little over 50 kilometers an hour. So the Sea Hunter's exceptional design features mean that it is intended to operate in incredibly rough seas. It can operate at up to sea state 5, which is where waves can be as high as 2 meters and winds can be as fast as 39 kilometers per hour. Each Sea Hunter costs around $15,000 to $20,000 to run per day, while the Destroyer costs over $800,000 to run per day. So the Sea Hunter is not only more efficient, it's cheaper. At 480 kilometers per hour, that's 68 rotations per second, and withstanding about seven tons of tearing force. Michelin and Bugatti had to co-design a special tire. Since due to the design of these vehicles, they are 
pressing into the road with higher and higher force as they increase in speed. So that drastically increases the forces that these tires are subjected to. The trick was to reinforce the tire without adding much weight. And so that reinforcement is made of carbon fiber. Now that carbon fiber is 10 times stronger than steel and five times as light. The body of the car is made of aluminum and carbon fiber, which makes it relatively light, but so strong, you have to apply five tons on one end of the car to get it to twist by a single degree. This monster is 4.544 meters long, 2.038 meters wide, and 1.212 meters tall. It's got a wheelbase of 2.711 meters. Trying to move an object that large at that speed is going to come with some challenges. The technology that goes into keeping this car on the ground and keeping it going the direction we want it to is what's really amazing. The shape of a vehicle in cross-section, so when you look at a vehicle like the Chiron from the side, it actually has the same shape as an airplane wing. And airplane wings cause lift. The air going up over the car has to travel further than the air going under the car. What happens is, is that creates a low pressure on the top of the car. The air having to travel further reduces the pressure, and that creates lift. We're actually creating suction on top of the car, and that's trying to separate the car from the roadway. The engineers for the Chiron designed air curtains at the front of the vehicle that direct the flow away from under the vehicle, reducing the pressure under the vehicle.